America is the land of opportunity. If you want to make something of yourself in this country, there's little stopping you. But in many other parts of the world, the will and desire to succeed is abundant, but the opportunity to do so isn't. In some of the poorest nations, a mere $50 is enough for an individual to start a business and become successful enough to pull themselves out of poverty. For over 25 years, Opportunity International has provided impoverished people with microloans to start small businesses. Today, the organization helps more than a million people in over 28 countries by giving them what we take for granted every day, the opportunity to change their lives. Opportunity International is the hub for the hopeless. Opportunity International is in the business of transforming lives and we use microfinance as the methodology. Opportunity's mission is to provide access to the working poor to capital to help grow their businesses and to help them work their way out of poverty. And that's an incredibly huge goal. You may ask yourself why are some countries rich while others are poor? Economics may hold the answer. Economics is the study of how a country uses its resources to produce goods and services and how they're distributed among various groups and individuals. Poverty is a very complex issue and there's a number of great books written on the concept but most of the time they would, will tell you it's very multi-dimensional. Try and eradicate poverty. You need so many tools. Microfinance is one big tool that you can use but you need hospitals, you need schools. So if we could even groom our clients to be able to do some of these things, you know, can you imagine? That could help. But, I mean, poverty is a big thing and everybody needs to be involved. In 1776, Adam Smith wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. He believed that providing the freedom for individuals to own land and keep profits from a business they own were essential to the success of a nation. Not only would people work harder if they had incentives to do so, but the economy would prosper since these people would create an abundance of resources for all. He called this the invisible hand or the process that turns self-directed gain into benefits for all. For example, a client I met with in Uganda started by having a daycare. She expanded that daycare into being a school and now she also has a catering business and she's able to use the school compound as a place to host events on a Saturday. So what she's doing, much like any other good business person, is making the most of her assets to be able to get a larger return and in turn she is employing more people and serving her community. You may have heard the phrase, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Let's take that a step further. Teach a person to start a fish farm and they will be able to feed a village for a lifetime. That's the secret to economic development that Opportunity International fosters around the world. Pamela was looking for a business that she could you know, do. Uh, she decided she didn't want to be just selling yam or selling bananas like the other women. Uh, she decided to, to go into the mushroom you know, business. She learned how to produce mushrooms, so we went to visit you know, her small mushroom uh, production thing by you know, her, uh, her house. Uh, she provides employment to three other people. But again, that alone would be significant because she is feeding her family, she is sending her husband to school, okay, and she is providing employment to three people. Impressive story, but even more impressive to me again was Pamela told us she had trained over 100 other Ghanaians in the mushroom production. Uh, skills and they had their own small shacks where they were producing mushrooms. What we're talking about here is free market capitalism. Capitalism is an economic system where the factors of production and distribution are privately owned and operated for profit. Capitalism has led to much of the world's wealth creation and is the foundation of the US economic system. 
Free market capitalism only works when people have four basic rights. The right to own property, the right to own a business and keep its profits, the freedom to compete with any other business, and the freedom to work wherever you want. Now, obviously, having uh, all of uh, such rights uh, would be very, very helpful, you know, for the people that we, we, we are trying to serve, uh, to the extent that you don't have a government uh, coming to interfere or to uh, prevent, you know, an individual from uh, achieving the maximum of uh, his or her God-given potential. Uh, that obviously is great. Unfortunately. Not all of the countries will allow people uh, to uh, enjoy all of those rights. We have recently started working with some folks and the government to work on some land title issues to help accelerate that. Because in the end, you do need to also have the opportunity to buy and own your land or the equity you've built up, the business you've built up, whether it's a farm or whether it's the restaurant, can all of a sudden disappear on a whim. So how do free markets work? Basically, the decisions about what to produce, how much to produce, and at what price are determined by buyers and sellers negotiating for goods and services, or in other words, the forces of supply and demand. Supply is how much product a manufacturer is willing to sell at different prices. Demand is how much buyers are willing to purchase at different prices. Where the supply and demand curves cross on the graph is the equilibrium point, also known as the market price or the price determined by supply and demand. Opportunity International is really effective at, at helping to grow a free market economy. You are, are in a situation where you have interested, eager, talented business people that are looking to find a way to grow their business. We are providing access to loans so that they then can grow that business and then those businesses in turn hopefully grow and that community over time becomes more self-sufficient and sustainable. In countries that don't have free markets, businesses have no way of knowing what to produce and in what amounts. The government decides, but is often wrong, which leads to large shortages or surpluses. Another type of economic system is socialism, which is based on the premise that most basic businesses should be owned by the government so that profits can be distributed among the people. Socialist economies may have more social equality, free education and health care, but they also have much higher taxes, which means much of the incentive to work harder is taken away. Brain drain often results as many of the country's best and brightest people leave to other countries where their talents earn them more money. In that two to eight week period where we train them, it is very important because that is when we offer them training in financial management, business skills, and let them understand the importance of saving. From there, they'll then qualify for their loan, they'll understand what the loan requirements are, and they will continue to meet for each week of their loan cycle, continuing to get business and personal training so that they can be better business owners. That training then transcends to these, these women and these men being more effective business leaders and then passing that training on to their own staff and to their own family members. Communism, on the other hand, is a system where the government makes almost all the economic decisions and owns almost all the factors of production. Human rights often suffers. Plus, without the natural resources of supply and demand, shortages of basic needs like food, clothing, and shelter are common. These days, the trend around the world is towards mixed economies, which are a combination of free market economies and command economies. In mixed economies, some of the allocation of resources is made by the government and some by free markets. The United States is actually a mixed economy. Let's take a moment to talk more about the U.S. economic system. There are three indicators of economic conditions, GDP or gross domestic product, the unemployment rate, and price indexes, which measure the levels of inflation or deflation. When you compare these indicators to those of impoverished nations, the differences are staggering. We have uh, around three billion people uh, living under two dollars, with two dollars a day. 
you know, or less. We have one billion people, you know, around the world, globally, living on one dollar or less a day. Okay, so that, that's one, you know, uh, st uh, statistic that we, we could share. The other is that you would have countries, depending again on uh, which uh, continents you're talking about, so Africa and Latin America, you know, to some extent, where per capita GDP could be as little as $140, for instance, in, in the case of my country. You know, it's very low. So take $140, compare it with the U.S. The U.S. is what? 30, 40,000? I, I don't know who, what it is. So you compare, you can see that the, the gap is huge. You, you can't, you know, even compare. Even with all of our wealth, our economy rises and falls. These fluctuations are known as the business cycle and has four cycles which are boom, or when business is booming, recession, which is two or more quarters of GDP decline, depression, which is a severe recession, and recovery, which is when the economy stabilizes and begins to grow again. In a mixed economy like ours, the government uses fiscal policy to try to keep the economy stable by increasing or decreasing spending or taxes. The government also uses monetary policy to manage the supply of money and control interest rates. The Federal Reserve controls how much money is available to businesses in order to speed up or slow down the growth of the economy. So it's easy to understand how our economy has flourished in good economic times and bad. It's also easy to understand how important Opportunity International's mission is to create the same type of economic development in countries where it currently doesn't exist. The key to successful economies is freedom, and the result of freedom is the opportunity for all to have a better life. All you need is people with a mindset to be able to do it, people willing to try at least, because the, my experience with the poor is that when you give them money, they want to pay back. They just want the opportunity for somebody to trust them. We are in the midst of a major campaign to expand our efforts in Africa with the goal of, by 2015 to mobilize a billion dollars to benefit a hundred million working poor individuals and families in that continent. If uh, we can start thinking already about not just ourselves and our future and our careers, what can we do for this person, you know, next to me or in some other country um, who really has nowhere to turn, who is really suffering? And here I am equipped with all kinds of maybe skills that could benefit. What can I do to make a difference? Even in tough global economic times, exciting career opportunities for college graduates exist, and many are far more varied than they were just a couple of decades ago. Why? Because today the business world has grown to what is now truly considered a global market. Students who are trained in global business stand a solid chance of not only joining this market, but having a positive impact on it too. CH Tome Hill is a 60 plus year old engineering company that became an engineering and construction company in the last couple of decades. Primarily we focus on a number of fields including uh, water, supply, treatment, and disposal of waste. And our clients are mainly government, industry, energy companies, and we offer them things from ranging from consulting to design, design build, operations. On the surface, it's engineering, but underneath it, it's really about solving a bunch of problems that have to deal with making life better for people. CH2M Hill provides solutions that positively impact people in all corners of the globe. CH2M Hill prides itself in helping its clients build a better and more sustainable world to live in. Let's look at the global economy a little more closely and see how companies like CH2M Hill, and maybe someday you, 
can positively impact it. Our company started after World War II in 1946 by a professor and his graduate students at Oregon State in Corvallis, Oregon. It's gone from that evolution of a professor and three students to a company today made up of over 30,000 people and over $7 billion. In the U.S., there are over 310 million people. That's a lot of potential consumers for manufacturers and distributors to target, right? Well, there are over 194 countries in the entire world consisting of over 6.9 billion people. Because many of these markets are easier to reach than ever before, there is significantly more potential for global trade and commerce. Conversely, for consumers, there are a lot more opportunities to purchase goods. This global expansion has made and continues to make companies rethink how they do business because it's not always conducted in the same fashion as it is within the U.S. The importance of a global market for us and any other company is the fact that it expands your business borders. The global market is very important to CH2ML. It's really a big part of our future. For a company of our scale to continue to be a vibrant place and make a contribution to the world, we have to operate globally. In the global arena, some countries are fortunate to possess a wealth of natural resources, but may be lacking in other areas, such as technological skills. Other countries might just be the opposite. Comparative advantage, a theory developed by 19th century economist David Ricardo, is a principle that states Countries should sell to other countries those products and services it produces most effectively and efficiently, and it should purchase from other countries those that they don't. Teach Tom Hill does operate under a comparative advantage. You can see that in some of the work that we've been doing over the last 15 years. Our solutions come in the way of people. We can't readily outsource it because it's intellectual capital. Our people collectively working in teams and, and leveraging solutions with other projects that we've done around the world is really what we bring to the issues and to the opportunities wherever we do business. Firms small and large are involved in global trade. However, there are definitely some risks and challenges involved with getting started in global trade, but the potential reward can be huge. Being a global company and working in many different countries and geographies around the world, the legal aspects and the regulatory aspects are very, very real. And it does require people that have deep knowledge to make sure that we're doing the things, number one, first and foremost, to protect our business. And, and number two, to make sure that when we work outside of our home that we're doing the right thing so that we don't cause issues and problems for the client that we're working with and certainly our employees that work around the world. There are many ways companies can enter the global market. Some key strategies are licensing, exporting, franchising, contract manufacturing, international joint ventures, and strategic alliances, and foreign direct investment. Each of these strategies has advantages and drawbacks to them. Most effective strategies that CH Tom Hill has found in, in entering other countries is the alliances and joint venturing. I know right now in Saudi Arabia we're in a joint venture with a Saudi company that gives us both credibility locally, gives us resources locally, we bring some of the American technology that we developed. That's an example of where the joint venture has really helped us. There are several forces that can affect trading in global markets. One of the most important and sometimes overlooked or ignored is socio-cultural forces. Failure to recognize these can be the proverbial kiss of death in a particular market for a company. There are definitely socio-cultural issues to keep in mind in dealing with work in other parts of the world. So we have to understand and appreciate the world that we're operating within, be sensitive to it and appreciate those nuances, but not forget who we are either. Another set of forces to be reckoned with are economic and financial. Companies need to tailor their strategies to the cultural and economic viability of potential customers in different cultures. In areas of the world where the cost of living is lower and the salaries are lower, it's not economical to bring in people from the U.S. We can take advantage of places with lower cost of living and thus lower salaries to help uh, support work elsewhere so we can even out the salary ranges and use those differences in salaries to our advantage. On another front, the waters can get a little murky when dealing with legal and regulatory forces. 
In a global economy, there isn't a central system where laws and regulations apply the same to everyone. Firms need to know about and keep up with laws and regulations throughout the world in order to effectively conduct global commerce. As we expand our business outside of the United States, we are faced not only with regulatory challenges in the United States, but also all over the world. And we need to adjust, we need to understand the market where we play. We rely on advisors, people who know things well in the specific markets. We also have members of our own legal team who are not just based in the United States, they're based throughout the world. The emphasis is always to be closer to the game, understand the local requirements, and making sure that you know how things change. Physical and environmental forces play a role in foreign trade too. Some countries' infrastructure is so primitive that transportation and storage of goods can be extremely challenging. Even lack of things we take for granted, such as cell phone and internet service, makes doing business very difficult. Dealing outside of your familiar borders is always interesting in that it poses a lot of issues and certainly it's not always easy. For instance, in the UK, we're doing a lot of work for Thames Water, which is the water utility for the City of London. Their subsurface infrastructure that's 150 years old, how do we disrupt the fewest number of people by taking water mains out, or how do we make sure that we don't disrupt the tube operation by when we take some of our electrical work out? Possibly the biggest hurdle for global trade is trade protectionism. This occurs when countries limit the amount of importing into their country. Protective tariffs and import quota limits are forms of trade protectionism used to protect domestic products. While we're a U.S. company, much of our services originates elsewhere, and we need to be aware of U.S. sanctions, export control and trade controls, but we need to be equally aware of similar sanctions in the European community or in the countries of the Asian continent. So again, staying on top of things and understanding the local rules where we do business is very important. The World Trade Organization, WTO, is the body that hears disputes amongst its member countries. Although it works to mediate and is an independent organization, it still has not solved every problem and issue that has been presented to it. CH2 Hill is a publicly reporting company. We have 18,000 shareholders, so the rules of the Securities and Exchange Commission apply to us. As a U.S. headquartered company, of course, the U.S. laws apply to us no matter where we work. So most people know how that works and what they need to do. What they know less about is that the U.S. is not the only country with those regulations. So how do we support U.S. requirements while at the same time respect requirements of those other countries. Those are the kind of challenges we deal with every day. So what does the future of global trade look like? It's hard to deny the fact that 6.9 billion people make for quite an attractive market opportunity. One country that has taken advantage of this is China, now the largest exporter in the world. Other countries in Asia, India and Russia with their large population bases also present opportunities for business trade. Dealing with a global economy, just the economic turmoil that sometimes can hit us, it's business sophistication, it's, it's your ability to really lure and attract the best talent in the world to help you deal with these things. The companies that can do this well have a competitive advantage. In recent years, many large companies have been outsourcing some of their functions, such as accounting, payroll, and even call centers. The shift to this trend has helped reduce costs for U.S. companies due to the lower wage global markets. And as the technical capabilities of people around the world continue to get better, outsourcing will increase. It is important then for U.S. workers to continue to hone their skills through training in order to continue to be marketable in the future. Countries around the world do bring us in because they don't readily have that expertise. Maybe they're an emerging geography, maybe that's it's just an expansion of their population and, and the needs are such that they have to bring in the expertise to help give them solutions to move forward. So in essence, uh, other countries are outsourcing by hiring us. As you begin thinking about types of careers you might desire to be a part of, consider broadening your thought process by thinking globally. Learn about foreign cultures, study foreign languages, and take business classes. The global economy is not going away. The more you understand it and the cultures that are part of it, 
the better chance you have to succeed within it. Are you prepared to be part of this type of success? We look at our future and our future is bright because we work on things that people need and we deliver those services in the ways that people like to have them delivered. As the global marketplace expands, we're going to be there. Uh, we are a global player and we want to remain a global player. We're all the sum total of our knowledge and experience, but we're really the sum total of our willingness and ability to learn and our curiosity and passion for what it is we do every day. Being an educated member of the workforce is very important, but focus your education globally, not just in your own backyard.